I work with M8 Capital. Uh, we're a VC firm based out of London. All we invest in is mobile, right? Uh, within mobile, we'll do apps, middleware, platform, really anything with a software angle to it. Given that all that we sort of think, dream, live about is mobile and all the investment is mobile, we're, we have a fairly global mandate. So, so far we've done eight investments, of which uh, four in the US, three are in Europe, and one in Japan. Of course, we're as excited as you guys are about the Indian ecosystem, and we're hoping to meet more and more startups here and uh, hopefully work with them in the future. Now, uh, with regards to today's topic, which is how to take a mobile app international from day one, so there's two things. Firstly, this topic is a bit off-putting because the truth of the matter is, if you guys are creating apps or working in the mobile ecosystem, chances are you're already global from day one, whether you like it or not, right? That's just the way that the app stores have been set up. So a classic anecdote I like to always bring up in this is uh, one of my colleagues' wives actually runs a startup. Uh, it was incubated at 500 startups with Dave McClure. Uh, funded by Excel, based out of New York, and it's a topic that's very close to my heart. Um, it's a local product discovery app for women, for shoes and bags. Right? So these guys are sitting in the West Coast, they launched their app, super excited, they're hoping for early adopters in New York, etc. And surprise, surprise, they find that of the first 30,000 users, 10,000 come from Saudi Arabia. Right? So they're there scratching their heads going, what the hell does this mean? Do we actually have to move to Saudi Arabia, et cetera, et cetera? And they actually speak to a few customers and realize that if you're an average woman in Saudi Arabia, you're obviously wearing a hijab. And what's the two things that you can show off and that you're most excited about? It's obviously your shoes and your bags, right? So that was one of their aha moments where they realized that sitting in the West Coast, they were already a global company. And when they had to think about growth, it was obviously, they had to ask themselves very different questions, right? Now, the second thing that's off, off putting about this topic is perhaps I'm suggesting that you guys should think global from day one and forget the fact that you have such a large market here, which is India, right? No, that's not the case at all. If anything, um, it, at least again, putting on the investor hat, when we sort of meet companies and startups based out of, let's say, Asia or South America, what really, really excites us about them is when they actually have a local approach that we think could do something different globally. Right? So here I'll give you an example of a company that we invested in out of Japan. Five guys, all engineers, tech-heavy team. Uh, they actually want to crack the app discovery problem, right? which we will all agree any part of the world is a huge, huge issue for the users, app developers, operators, ecosystem alike. So these guys came to us with a very Japan-centric approach which, truth be told, I don't know if it'll sort of translate in the rest of the world, but at least we're willing to sort of work with them to see it through, right? Fact of the matter is, if they had proposed a standard, we will use social recommendations to provide app recommendations, et cetera, et cetera, which is what a lot of West Coast startups do, we're much better off working with a West Coast startup. So again, like I said, there's two things about this topic that's off putting, which is not true. One is the fact of the matter is you're global already, whether you like it or not. And two, just because you're global doesn't mean that you should understate or, let's say, place less importance on the Indianness of, of your apps or your approach. So broadly, three topics that are, or sub-points I'd like to cover. One, why go, why go global? Um, honestly, this is a little bit of a no-brainer. Uh, all the data, as you guys will know, suggests that most users will come outside of the US and Europe, and my colleagues in the US and Europe might not like this, but that is the truth. So you guys are sitting in a sweet spot. Uh, two, how to successfully launch outside your home market. Right? So again, I'll take you guys through a few sort of case studies of, on what has and hasn't worked in the past. And it's just tough for you to sort of keep in the back of your mind when you're sort of churning out product. Uh, thirdly, this is where I kind of come in with a shameless plug and tell you what it's like to be an international investor and what, is, what you guys should think about when you're working with an international investor. So on the first point, why go global? So this, what I call here, is a no-brainer slide, right? It doesn't matter that there's squares and circles. Fact of the matter is, there's, it's likely that anyone with a feature phone or a normal phone will have a smartphone in the next five years. Playing the sheer numbers game, we know that there's massive addressable markets that exist in India, China, Bangladesh, Indonesia, etc. 
And most technology companies, VCs and startups, are sort of opening up to that fact, right? So right now, obviously, the hot topic, if you can speak to the community in the West Coast, is Brazil. But I have no doubt from now, and it's already trending that way, in sort of six months to a year, everyone is going to sort of herd to India and say, what the next big thing is going to come out of India, right? And you're already sort of seeing that. As an app maker, of course, like I said, what this means is you release your app across 180 countries from day one. Your addressable market is no longer India. It's no longer 30 states in India even. It's actually 200 countries. So I guess the best case studies to talk about are guys that have actually done it, right? Now, there's an interesting case study that I always like to talk about, which is Sweden. Let's put it in perspective. It's 9 million people, right, which is roughly one-third the size of Kerala, which is I'm from in India. However, time and time again, they're able to actually sort of punch above their weight and come up with these global heavyweights when it comes to technology. So both Spotify and Skype have actually Scandinavian or Swedish origins, right? Uh, Spotify, of course, st start, launched out in, uh, in Sweden. I think they hit a million paying users in Sweden, which is when they were quite serious about Europe and moving outside. Now, the key thing on why Sweden is such an amazing chess market and what we can learn from it is they have extremely high tax rates, it seems, right? And normally that would be a huge problem, except that they have this uniform base of people. So of the 9 million people, roughly 6 to 7 million people all are within the same income bracket, and they're fairly tech savvy. So if you were to try a product, or let's say try and test a product, it turns out that Sweden is the perfect market to do that because they're all fairly uniform, right? Your learnings from there, of course, you can sort of expand and use elsewhere. Going back to, I think earlier today was Narendra from Intel. He said, of course, you should go global, et cetera, et cetera. But the important thing is to identify a niche that you really understand and that you can work on. Fact of the matter is there's a billion people and if Sweden at nine billion people is one fantastic sliver or segment, we have multiple segments, whatever you want to sort of try out in India, right? So it could be urban, middle class, it could be rural, illiterate. Whatever segment you want, you'll find a huge enough sort of sample size in India to actually make it work, which is an advantage that you guys have, but guys in the States, for example, don't. Secondly, Skype, I guess this is another point, which is fact of the matter is you have no choice. You are international. It's a great, great case study on how to actually pull it off. Started off with Scandinavian origins, Swedish. The development team is in, um, in Estonia. But like last week, I, was, I met one of their earlier investors who's based on Europe, and I said, do you consider them a European company, or do you consider them like an American company? He said, he doesn't know, right? Because of course they have these sort of Swedish and uh, Estonian roots when it comes to tech. But a lot of their senior management sits in London. Their CEO sits in the US for obvious reasons. And it turns out that from all these regions combined, they only sort of get 30% of their revenues. They in fact make most of their money out of emerging markets. Right? So again, I guess the key takeaway or what I love about these small Swedish upstart companies is out of nowhere, they're able to sort of establish a global platform just because the concept makes sense and the product is so good. Now, when it comes to successfully launching outside your home market, I think this is something we come across a lot because we interact a lot with uh, startups out of Japan, right? And one of the things I always love, uh, sort of, uh, when, when we sit down with Japanese entrepreneurs, especially in the gaming sector, uh, is to sort of take them through the cultural differences between a Japanese gamer and then, let's say an Indian or a Western gamer. Now, if you play a typical Japanese game, like how many of you guys know Kairosoft? Okay. Probably not too many. Uh, they're a super indie Japanese development shop, right? All they care about is Japanese markets. Uh, all their, none of their games are free, right? They, they charge a buck a game. And it's very Japan focused in the sense that you can set up, let's say, uh, a resort with hot springs, which is what the Japanese do on vacation. Right? They go and sort of take communal showers. Now, these guys, they act, in terms of their walkthrough screens, actually have 15 walkthrough screens, which explains each and everything about the story of the game, what the various commands are, etc. Fact of the matter is, the average person in India or the US actually gets frustrated by this process. Right? So, if you're playing a game here, 
you actually want to start playing the game from the se second minute onwards. You don't want 15 walkthroughs. And that's where sort of that cultural difference comes through. And it's important to understand the context and tell a story that the user in that specific geography actually wants to hear. Right? Now, I'm, I'm not trying to slate the Japanese and the Koreans for their game making. Uh, fact of the matter is, these guys like Carisoft, Nexon, uh, Gree, DNA have been re have completely reinvented the current gaming model, on, which was again something that the Japanese did with Nintendo, Sega, etc. Right? So they're by, by far the leaders. But when it comes to understanding the cultural context, I think they've sort of missed a step, which is something that it's an important learning for us all. Now. On the same example, understanding the cultural context, how you can learn from the Japanese is, I was speaking to someone from Playfish, right, which at a certain time was mentioned the same way in Zynga. They were based out of London, they were acquired for EA for over $400 million. These guys were burning through cash, creating these small social games, right? At this stage, none of them had sort of experimented with virtual currency. Uh, when all of a sudden, a really smart techie, junior guy in, in, in some East the CEO, uh, came up to him one day and said, look, we're not making any money. There's these guys in Korea called Nexon. They're charging uh, $1 for every flower in the game. And the CEO's instinct was like, okay, that's the most stupid idea I've ever heard. But if it's worked in Japan, let's sort of tailor it, right, a little bit. Understand what the U US or the UK user wants. And bam, let's see if it works. You fast forward and you, guys, you have guys like Zynga, Playfish, who made games like Cityville, Farmville. Um, the Sims, right? These are all the same studios that made it. And now, now when you sort of ask them about monetization, the same guy me will tell you about a guy in Saudi Arabia who spends $100,000 a month on Farmville on cows. Right? So it's, the point is, yeah, we have different cultures. The stuff that works, you need to sort of adapt it when you move to another market. Another no-brainer slide, and, and here is just a classic example of an easy thing that one could do, and that one we expect actually a lot of developers to do in the coming sort of 12 to 18 months. There's actually this massive, let's say, gap when it comes to language, right? Uh, now, to sh briefly explain this slide, all things are well and good if the dotted circle and the full circle are completely aligned, right? That means for every, let's say, Tamil native speaker, there are enough sort of Tamil apps, or let's say apps in Tamil, for them to actually use and digest. The fact of the matter is, you and I both know that most apps in this world are made in English, right? Or Western languages, and hence there's this huge gap. I guess when you sort of work in countries like India and China, uh, what, the, what the entrepreneurs tell me is the gap is not necessarily based on language, but even how you can interact, because most of these people Let's, let's use the example again of Chinese, with the script that they use, can't just do. You actually don't have people very comfortable typing stuff. So then they have to sort of move to a speech input. Right? So long story short, over the next 12 to 18 months, everyone expects that if you are an average app maker, you will pick out your key geographies that you find interesting, and at very minimal cost, at least localize the language. Right? That's the sort of first step. One of the best examples that I like to, again, uh, mention to all, our, all the companies that I work with is AutoCAD, right? Um, sorry, AutoCAD WS. So it's as boring enterprise an app as can be, right? Uh, you have an iPad, you can sort of review structures and diagrams. Uh, there's nothing, nothing funky, nothing social about it. These guys are, again, classic startup enterprise, no marketing money, there's no virality in the product. And they're like, okay, scratching the heads completely trying to understand how they actually grow their user base. Now, fast forward, I think 18 months after launch, they have 10 million users, right? And the CEO of that company says the one thing that it did come down to is localization. So what do they do? They actually built a story around the app, right? So for example, when they launched an Android version of the app, uh, and I'm a huge Android buff myself, one thing that most Android buffs like is the little green Android, right? I find him cute, most, most iOS guys will completely think he's ridiculous. But if you're an Android buff, that's what appeals to you. So they went back and said, okay, let's actually create a character using the little green Android guy. I, mean, I don't know how they got past trademark issues. Pair him up with a girl. And, and of course, this is a story that all of a sudden resonates with their target audience, right? Which happens to be structural engineers. 
Then, for example, when they had to launch an app in Italy, they could have quite easily just used their demo mock-up stuff from the US, right, which is home for them. They could have had the Golden Gate Bridge. They could have had the Statue of Liberty. But they said, OK, no, let's go in with a purely Italian approach. So in all our demos, we're going to have the leading sour pizza, pizza, right? Which, let's be honest, even if you're not from Italy, you're kind of curious how this thing manages to lean without tipping over. But if you're Italian and you're a structural engineer, that's probably the one thing that really has always resonated with you. Right? So between sort of the green Android guy who looks like an engineer, uh, the leading tower of Pisa, placing the phone in Matrushka dolls for the Russians, this guy actually stumbled upon something which time and time again most app makers have now found to be super successful, which is understand the context of the market that you're entering and localize, right? Tell a story around it. And that's probably the one thing I'm just going to keep repeating as a theme uh, from most successful startups that I know. Now, the second one is sort of building an early a community around your early adopter base. Uh, how many of you guys have used an app called Wunderlist? Very few. So, Wunderlist is actually considered a relative European success story. Uh, started by six guys, sorry, five guys and a girl, between the ages of 22 and 25. Uh, they've raised multiple rounds of funding. It's a basic to-do list app. Right? Now their claim to fame uh, is that, of course it's a beautiful product that even I like using on a day-to-day -day basis, is that they actually hit a million users in less time than Twitter, Facebook, any of these guys. Right? And it's not a social product. It's, it's actually a plain, vanilla, note-taking app. Now, when I spoke to that team um, and sort of asked them what was the sort of one differentiating factor, one thing that they felt like count towards hitting a million users or downloads before anyone else, right? But by the way, this is with no marketing spend at all. They said it was about reaching out and understanding who their early users were, right? And this had a twofold effect, really. One, in terms of PR, right, uh, they were actually able to feed back these really cool use cases to the press who actually lapped it up and said, OK, this is something we want to talk about. Two, it actually galvanized the team, right? Because as you guys know in startups, when you're working really hard on product, you need all the wins and success stories you can get to keep the team motivated to keep churning out new features. So these guys specifically called out one example, which is they built this product. Uh, and it was actually used by an NGO-run school in Latin America. Right? And this school just couldn't thank them enough for making their lives so much easier with a simple to-do app. Sure, at the face of it, it sounds like just a feel-good story. But the fact of the matter is, this is exactly the kind of thing that the press wanted to hear about. Right? So they actually helped them further promote these sort of stories. And two, that actually helped, again, motivate the team. So getting customer testimonials and sort of building an early it's a community around them is another factor that we've noticed actually helps a lot. Now the third and the fourth point is uh, fairly, uh, I guess, related, which is creating a direct channel to your customers and actually being willing to pick up the phone or speak or email and speak to these guys. So uh, when we work with our more early stage portfolio companies, uh, more often than not, when they go through this introspection process, they come up with this thing, which is on a quarter by quarter basis, they set up a target for saying, okay, we will speak to and interview 250 people. Right? Uh, and this is not just the CEO or the marketing guys. This is also forcing uh, the guys behind the product, the UI UX guys, the developers, to actually s speak to the customers who probably come from completely different backgrounds because, let's say, I'm guessing most of us here have college degrees. Is that the case? Right? I hope so. Um, but your average user is unlikely to sort of be comparable to you at all. So to be able to address that sort of gap between your understanding of the customer and the customer's perception of your product, it's important to actually reach out to them on a regular basis and understand what works and what doesn't. And, and this is where focus groups actually completely fail. Because if you put a group of six people together, you'll always have one or two people speaking a lot. Whereas if you reach out to each person individually, that's when you really uncover the nuggets of information that are most useful for your product and your use case. So again, AutoCAD, fantastic, uh, fantastic case study. Learning is that personally, uh, at least I make sure that all the companies that I meet uh, tend to at least sort of keep in the back of their mind. 
Now, going back to the first point I made, which is localization, uh, it goes beyond sort of understanding the culture and, let's say, uh, the specific context of specific countries. It, it actually also means that you have to sort of drill down into monetization. Right? Now, I, 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 this, this chart is quite dense, and I won't sort of take you through it bar by bar. But bottom line, when you add a native language to an app, and this is stuff that was in Google and I think last week, uh, you pretty much get a 100% increase in downloads. Right? And a 30% roughly increase in monetization. Right? Just this one small simple factor. It's only because people are more comfortable paying for apps that they feel are tailored to them. So specific things around sort of monetization by country, by app store, completely differ from the way you are, you are used to stuff in India. And that's just important to sort of keep in mind. Um, you had a whole lot of guys come here and tell you about platform choices and that you should develop for one versus many, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, 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 don't, I, I don't need to sort of get into the spiel, but when we sort of work with most markets, at the very least, we request our portfolio companies to think about Android and OS. They're dominant across almost all geographies. Of course, there are exceptions, maybe like India, uh, where we have been told that 460 million are Nokia phones. But truth of the matter is that you definitely need to make sure that Android and iOS are in your radar. Uh, specific use cases are different, like countries, like I was speaking to guys from Africa last week, and they were all about SIM game for some reason, right? Uh, so that might differ, but even if you are getting to a sort of stage where you want to go international, you want to speak to VCs, make sure that you have your bases covered in terms of Android and iOS. Now, the second thing to sort of keep in mind in terms of platform choice is there are specific countries out there where being an Android or having an Android app will actually help you get users easier than an iOS app. Now, these specific countries, uh, the operator actually con still controls the flow of applications, right? And, and owns a billing relationship with most users. So uh, I'm, I'm sure you guys are aware, Apple has a sort of you know, garden approach, whereas Android is far more open and operator friendly. So if you take a market like Japan, Korea, or China, uh, in fact, most apps are not pushed through the uh, Apple Store or the Google Play Store. They're actually pushed through operator like stores. You know? And I'm talking about significant majority. So if you go, most of these guys, uh, like we speak to Docomo, for example, which is the number one operator in Japan on a regular, uh, we speak to them on a regular basis, and they're very keen to sort of work on preload bases, etc. Right? So for them, as soon as an app has sort of hit between 750,000 downloads to a million downloads, that's something relevant that they want to port over to Japan. And if you're not Android ready and you can tick the box at that stage, uh, you, you're probably missing out on that one opportunity. Now, the third bit is executing on international. Right? Um, of course, we talked about localizing on global platforms. Um, language, context, everything needs to be sort of storified, for the lack of a better word. Uh, the one consistent feature that we found that works for app makers, by the way, in terms of acquiring new users is actually Facebook integrations. Uh, I'm sure Simon, Simon sort of took you through why that's important, etc. But when these guys, when most of the guys we invested tried acquiring, tried lots of partnerships, blah, 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 they, you don't necessarily get sticky users by paying for downloads, right? So, uh, of course, I encourage everyone to experiment around it, but it's almost always never worked, right? Even stuff like Twitter integrations, et cetera, just importantly, doesn't close the loop. Last week, I met someone from Germany that's trialing TV ads uh, for, for mobile applications. Again, I don't know if that'll work, but the one thing that's consistently managed to work is the Facebook integration, so keep that in mind. Secondly, in terms of, uh, sorry, the third point, which is, now, as much as you think that all these app stores sort of talk to each other, the fact of the matter is that the ecosystem is quite disparate in itself. Uh, I'll, I'll use the example of Snapet once again. So, Snapet, like I said earlier, was the, with the guys who sort of found that one third of the early users were from Saudi Arabia. So they're doing fantastically well now. China is their next growth market. Uh, they're considering moving there, etc. One of the things that I'm sure you guys have noticed this as well: when an app store sort of picks you as sort of top of the rank or top of the chart, they tend to do that uniformly or universally. Um, Within, this, within, a, within a set period of time across all global apps. Right? So 
it's almost sort of like a scattergun approach and you have limited sort of control on it. So these guys, for example, all of a sudden found that they weren't even supposed to be, uh, let's say, featured in the app stores in Germany and Western Europe. But the next thing you know, they've been featured, they have lots of downloads, except that they have no content for that. They're not localized for that. So it's important when you have sort of picked your growth markets, you build your ecosystem and know everyone from who the Apple guy is in charge of the app store, uh, who the PR people are in terms of getting the plugs for within relevant sets of blogs, etc. And so what sort of building relationships with that ecosystem. Typically, your VCs are supposed to help you with this as well, so just bear that in mind. Now, the other thing, um, and this, this is something that obviously, I, I'm sort of struggling to understand myself, which is most Indian startups, for example, don't necessarily get a lot of coverage with Western publications, right? Um, but the fact of the matter is it's not just Indian, it's whether you're Japanese or Chinese, TechCrunch or, well, most tech periodicals love to cover what happens in the Valley and that's it. Now, having said that, there are some exceptions on how you can get coverage. So, of course, if you do something ridiculously cool from a technology standpoint, uh, most, most journalists would, would love to cover it. But the second, uh, other milestones would be if you've raised funding, right? So, there's at least two portfolio companies that we've made investments in, but we've not announced it yet or done a huge PR jump around it. Really because we won't actually wait for these guys to have product announcements that they can make the feature of this press release. So that's the sort of second thing that the press loves to talk about, uh, funding situations. Now, going back to my previous point, which is that India is expected to be the hotspot for entrepreneurship and everyone expects these crazy models on mobile to come from India. It's a very hot topic with journalists. Right? So make sure that when you sort of introduce your company, uh, introduce your product, you sort of pitch or tailor it according to the India story, right? Explain how there are XYZ users who else, uh, had it not been for your product in India, like not got access to some sort of service or not, and how that's applicable to a Western market. It's those sort of stories that really sort of, I'd say, hits a chord with Western journalists and make sure that you're really pushed when it comes to PR. The fourth bit, um, I, I think I'm sort of preaching to the converted here. You guys know this as well. Most geographies, app stores is the only way to get distribution. Right? Um, I've had my portfolio companies try out tons of other ways, uh, but they will keep on uh, app stores to work. The only exceptions, like I said, are Asia. Uh, sorry, Asia, I mean sort of Japan, Korea, China. So in Japan, for example, I, I don't know if any of you guys use Evernote. Uh, it's a large sort of cloud-based uh, retrieval, note-taking application system. And we have 35 million users now. Uh, an operator in, in Japan, uh, Docomo, actually pays Evernote a dollar a month per user for their premium product, right? So the equivalent would be if Bharti Airtel here decided to subsidize Spotify by paying, I don't know, 50 rupees a month, and that comes directly from your server or rather they eat up that cost. So we're finding operators in some part of the world are actually willing to pay app makers themselves to subsidize premium products, which of course if you catch on to it is the holy grail, because all of a sudden you don't need to worry about promotion, you don't need to worry about billing, everything just sort of takes care of itself and we're talking about sort of going from zero to five million paying users instantaneously. The second thing that we're noticing operators doing in terms of distribution is uh, setting up app packages. So Docmo actually released this, I think it was last, I oh know, earlier this year, maybe it's April or uh, May. It's, you pay 300 yen a month, right, which is roughly about I think four dollars, I think, three or four dollars. And you get a selection of about a thousand apps, all cloud-based, and then they sort of worry about splitting that app, right, uh, in terms of splitting the money between the app makers. So, one, that's, that's, that was an interesting model that we weren't sure would take off, but their numbers have gone through the roof. And now that's something that we're seeing substantially a lot of operators trialing. Right? So Indonesia, there's an operator called Selkomindo, very aggressive, very innovative. Same thing. They're actually now preloading your apps, premium versions of your apps, into a whole basket of apps and selling that as a service. So these sort of models, I think, are very relevant distribution and monetization tools to you as app makers. But in general, 
uh, it goes without saying that the only way you can get distribution is by working with the app stores, which is the Apple store, the Google Play stores of the world, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, last bit, so I, th I think we're sort of coming to an end. Um, this is where, again, I, I sort of give you guys a shameless plug about sort of international VCs, what you can and cannot expect from them, and what's the sort of best way to work with them uh, in, in the sort of future. Like I said, I really think that you guys are in a great position because a lot of VCs are super interested in India, right? Uh, and it's a matter of time before they actually start investing significant amounts of money in India. Right? So I expect that to sort of really happen in the sort of next 12 to 18 months. Now, the few things to sort of keep in mind are, one, most international VCs uh, always look to sort of co-invest with a local VC, right? Um, now, it's, it's quite simply a, a fact of making sure that there's someone closer to home. When you guys are sort of working on your startup, you also need to be know, you also need to know that if something does come up and you desperately need help, you can easily call up someone um, and ask and sort of lean on them and ask them for advice, introductions, etc. So of course an international VC is expected to let's say lift the load when it comes to international stuff. But on the smaller operational issues, it always makes sense to have someone closer to home. And that's what the international VCs always look for in a startup. So make sure that you sort of nurture relationships with local VCs because there's no sort of jumping the gun and, and going straight to an international VC. Uh, secondly, again, I, I speak to startups all over, right? Um, and the one thing I've always noticed is there's nothing like a face-to-face -face meeting. Right? So you can have all the Skype calls that you can or want, um, but just sort of make sure that if possible, you can get the VC to come and meet you in person. Uh, the more than happy to sort of come to Bangalore or India. If not, you can always go and visit them. Uh, that's the one biggest sort of swing factor that I've noticed in, uh, in sort of the entire VC or fundraising discussion. Now, the third thing, and these are really quite administrative uh, stuff, is incorporation. Uh, most of you are probably incorporating in India. Whereas if you're a US VC, they'd love for you to be incorporated in the States. These are small factors that I'm sure most VCs will take you through. Again, I'm, I'm around often, if you ever, if you need to sort of chat about it, we take you through that as well. So th these are sort of a few things that um, I, I guess international VCs, or you need to bear in mind when working with international VCs. And of course, keep in the back of your mind, these, all, all these VCs are really sort of clamoring to work with you as startups as well. So you guys are in a great position. So th that's it for my talk, really, and uh, I'd, I'd like to sort of end with another small anecdote. Right? Now, uh, you guys know Path, the sort of mobile area, sort of social startup. Right? Now, a testament to how important internationalization is. When they released their last update, um, they were supporting like quite a few, let's say, ten new languages: like, like German, okay, that's obvious; uh, Portuguese, that's obvious; Brazil, Portuguese. And then there was also a dialect in Malaysia, right? And I was kind of, that kind of blew my mind. I'm like, why would you guys actually uh, want something in Malaysia? So, Pak actually has a special role called VP of Special Projects. Uh, it's a guy who's based out of the UK. And uh, I spoke to him about it, and he said, all of a sudden, one day, all these guys had thought that they were like marketing with KPIs, and they noticed that it was festival season in Malaysia. And then they had a huge spike of Malaysian users, right? Now, this guy, immediately the next day, he took a flight from London, went to Malaysia, spoke to users, and made sure within the next release that they had, they supported Malaysian languages, etc. And apparently now it is one of their sort of strongest growing and heaviest user bases. Now, the moral of the story, the moral of the story is not that if you sort of notice users in some job that you need to catch a flight out and go there because I'm sure that that's not being practical for everyone. Right? But more that most startups are actually taking this very seriously. right? Uh, and it's important to sort of have that perspective in mind, because you're never sure where your next sort of huge bunch of users will come from. Cool, that's it. Any questions, guys?